So the first thing is that there is an Anzac round tomorrow, uh, which is the last Anzac round of this year. So yeah, if you're planning on doing the ICPC or if, even if you're not, be good to do that and practice. Yeah. I'm just wondering, are most people here uh, already entered into the div divisionals? I think signups closed yesterday, if I remember my dates. Yeah. Yeah, Angus posted the link. Most people here looking to enter the divisionals, or, or they would have to be registered, or are people here just more casual about it. All right, well, yeah, whatever. The... <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's fine, yeah. Yeah, I'm just, yeah, okay. So, yeah, so today's workshop will be kind of similar to the other ones. Uh, so the first hour I'll be going through some problems with all of us about a top of this week's topic, which is data structures. And yeah, so data structures is kind of a vague topic name. That's not really a vague topic name, but uh, this, this particular problems that these, the problems that I'll be going through are kind of just a random selection that, that are related to data structures. There's not really a clean thread through everything except for their data structures related. Uh, but in particular, the data structures I think I'll be covering today, depending on time, will be uh, priority queues and union find. But that's not too important. What's important is that we start looking at problems because the problems will motivate the theory. So yeah, it won't be too theory intensive. It will mainly be revolving around, let's look at a few problems. And uh, if we need to cover any theory in order to solve them, then we will. Yeah. So I picked priority, priority queues in union find just because they're, they're fairly common and quite useful. And I guess give a good example of the kind of things data structures can handle in, in general. So yeah, so this problem has been up for a while. So in this problem, uh, you're given like a bunch of pairs of numbers and each pair represents a star and the first number actually the second the second number represents when that's okay you're gonna you're gonna buy as many stars as you can oh no, no you're not you're gonna buy stars as fast as you can and each star has a certain time that it costs to uh, buy it or collect it and you want so you want to collect k stars specifically. So k is smaller than the total number of stars or equal. So you want to determine uh, what's the shortest amount of time you can collect all the stars in. But then each star also has a condition, which is the second column. And that's saying in order to collect this star, I need to have collected at least this many stars before it. So that first star, this one. That means that this star takes one second to collect or minute or whatever. And uh, you can only collect it once you've collected at least zero stars. Now that's kind of meaningless because you always have already collected at least zero stars. So maybe this one's more interesting. So this one is saying, uh, you need to have already collected one star before you can collect it. You could have collected more than one star, but you have to have collected at least one. So just to go through the sample inputs, just to make sure the problem is clear. Uh, for this one, uh, you can see that if you, in the first second, or well, before you've bought anything, you can buy either of these because they both require zero stars before it. So you could buy this one, the top one or the bottom one, but the top one's cheaper, so we'll buy that. And so we've bought that and it took one second because that's its T value. And then, once we've taken that, it unlocks this and this. And so we want to 
buy one of them or we want to buy anything that's available. In this case, the best option could be to buy, say, three. The one that takes three seconds. Then we could buy that one for two. Then now we've collected three stars, so we could buy that one. And that costs two, two seconds. Okay, and that is eight in total. And for the next sample input, uh, Yeah, so in the first second, you will just want to buy that. That's the only thing you can buy. And in the second second, oh yeah, so yeah, in the second second, um, you have not, you, you can't satisfy either of these and you can't buy a star more than once. So once that's gone, that's gone. And so you have nothing else to do. So you can't reach your total of K equals three. Yeah, I don't know if I mentioned it, but yeah, you're trying to hit four stars before you finish. All right. Is this doc somewhere? Uh, this doc isn't anywhere, but hopefully I'll explain the problems and hopefully they'll make sense. But I'll just leave it here for, for a minute now. Um, people to think about the question, I guess. Do you have any idea? Yep. Yeah, that's a good idea. I guess everyone in here can take a screenshot if they want to refer back to the problem. Yeah, so I'll give it one minute. Let me know if anyone has any questions about the problem or confusions. Uh, or any ideas for the solution. Or any ideas for maybe even just a strategy that you'd use to collect case stars, even if it's maybe not a full solution. the best place to put the problem yeah it's also if you if you want to look it up later you can go there so south pacific's regionals 2018 problem c If anyone has any ideas, feel free to unmute, especially since it's a relatively small group today. All right. So I guess there's, yeah. So the observation for this problem is that at any given point in time, you're going to have a given amount of stars available. So some of them are going to be unavailable because you've already bought them. Some of them are going to be available and some of them are going to be unavailable because they have a big prerequisite. So like in our first example, uh, at the beginning, only, only this first one and this last one were available because everything else was pre had a prerequisite of, of a certain number of stars you already bought. And now, so at a given time, you have a certain number of stars that are available. Which one should you buy? In this case, a greedy algorithm is is fairly easy to come up with and fairly easy to verify. So the greedy algorithm is just, you pick the cheapest star you can buy or the one that takes the least time to collect. So yeah, time is just money in this, in this thing. It's just cost. There's no like other things dependent on time. But uh, yeah, so, so, so at any given time you have to keep track of which stars are available and you have to pick the cheapest one. And once you've bought it, you have to update your stars available. So I'll switch to this and to make it clearer exactly what's happening. So I um, so need to have some, some way of doing the following things. So 
we need to be able to we need to have some some data structure or it could just be like an array for now that tells you which stars are available in fact yeah so it's you can just kind of do it implicitly um i guess it's somewhat instructive to just implement the naive solution first so uh, Yeah, so as I said, the optimal strategy is to, is this big enough? Make it a bit big. Um, the optimal strategy is to, at any time, look at all the stars if you've collected, if you, um, that you've not collected yet, and pick the one that is available and is the cheapest. So. Choose the cheapest available star. Available meaning not yet taken and um and D is less than or equal to how many you've bought. Is it already? So yeah, you can probably see that you could implement that with kind of two for loops. So you'd go, so I is the number we've collected already. Uh, so we need to keep track of stuff. So we'll create an array to see which stars we've bought already, which is initially all false. And we'll also, yeah, that's it. So we need to find uh, the thing with, so for, for each star, so Uh, if this is valid, so if D of J is less than or equal to the number we've collected so far, then we can buy it. So we'll have some finger that's like cheapest and we'll initially set it to negative one. And we also want it to be, oh, um, we'll set it to, Yeah, maybe. And we want to make we want to, we only want to do this if we only want to take it if it's less than the cheapest option. So if cheapest option is already negative one, that means it's good. Or uh, or ti is less than t cheapest option. So, and then cheapest option equals J. Now, if there was nothing available from this method, then we are going to uh, not have anything to do. And in fact, our collected thing only needs to go up to K, right? So once we collected K, we're done. And if, if cheapest option, so if, if there was nothing that we could buy, Um, 
or print impossible exit name. And yeah, so the other thing we need to keep track of is what we've bought already. So initially they're all false, but so now we need to buy it. So bought cheapest option equals true and uh, our answer, which needs to be a long one. Um, our answer will now cost the cost of that star. And yeah, so this, and we had available meaning not yet taken. So not yet taken. Um, not bought Jeff. Now, now that we're done with that, we can just print. It's just how long it took. So that's. So if you understand this algorithm and why, uh, why this greedy algorithm solves the problem, uh, currently you can probably tell that it's too slow because there's two loops nested inside each other. So it, will, it could take a long time if K and N are both big and the array is big therefore. Um, yeah. So the, the, it's a good chance that I've messed this up and there's a mistake somewhere in here. So if there is, let me know. Otherwise, if you understand it, could you uh, do the thumbs up thing in Zoom? And in the meantime, I will make sure it compiles because it probably doesn't, knowing me. Ooh, six errors. And they just all that. Nice. I wasn't really paying attention to the hands, but I think I saw at least one thumbs up, which doesn't really tell much information because I would want more than one thumbs up. Yep, thanks. Okay, seems, yeah. So if you didn't put your thumbs up, let me know what is not clear because I can definitely go back. But yeah, I saw a few people thumbs up, so it can't have been too unclear. Oh uh, yeah, this PDF is not very well set up, so I have to type it in, 102131. Possible. That's fun. So, should it be cheapest option equals negative one instead of not equal? This one? Uh, on line uh, 19. And yep, thanks. Okay, eight. Thanks, Dallas. Um, yeah, so from the problem, you can also tell that the order of the stuff doesn't matter. Uh, also, uh, Andrew asked what cheapest option equal negative one does. Can you just explain that? Yeah. Um, is the code still not big enough? I can look it up. I don't know how long ago that was. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so cheapest option, we're just setting it to negative one as the default value before we've compared it to anything. There's probably better ways to do it, but whatever. And in fact, there probably are because I've managed to stuff it up somehow. Yeah, so, so yeah, so this is too slow if, if N and K are large. And the thing that we're realizing is that this loop is 
it feels like its functionality could be done a bit better because currently this loop is going through the whole thing just to find um, the biggest or the cheapest, the, the smallest option. So what we can do is we want a data structure such that we want to be able to um, put stars in when they're available and we want to pick out the cheapest star. So to make it fast, we need a data structure that can store, st store stars. Um, so such that we can put in stars and we can extract or we can, yeah, we can determine the cheapest star. Currently in there in the DS. And yeah, the final thing we need to be able to do is to take out the cheapest star. Take the cheapest star out of the DS. Yeah, nice Kevin. So yeah, this is a well-known problem, I guess, and a priority queue will solve it. So basically what a priority queue is, something that can do exactly this. And I won't go into the details today because it's not worth it of how exactly a priority queue works. But all you need to know is that in C++, you can include queue, and then you'll have a priority queue data structure. And in this case, well, not in this case, and to, to create it, you'll do that. And that means that its values are all ints. Um, yeah, so I'll show its functionality just by solving the problem. So instead of this loop, which I'll comment out, we want to say, yeah, I want to say if cheapest option. So instead of cheapest option, we'll just do, actually, I guess I'll comment out this whole thing. So so it's impossible if our thing is empty. So if, actually, yeah, so I'll start from the start. So we're collecting stars and at any point we wanna have in our data structure, uh, the available stars. So that means that at any stage, we have to add in the new stars that are now available once we've collected, once we've collected I stars. So now that we've collected I stars, we need to have some way of saying for star that costs I. Obviously that's not valid syntax, but star that costs I. And the syntax will be you don't push star. And how will we do this? Yeah, so in this case, it's kind of nice because our priority queue, the, the value and what we need from it is actually the same thing. So we don't actually need to determine the whole star. Like we don't need to determine its, um, its time, its, its D value. We only need its T value, which is its cost. So yeah, so we can determine the cost, which happens to be the measure of how cheap it is. And I think we'll see a problem later that it doesn't have that property. So you need to be a bit more, it, it's a tiny bit more involved implementation wise. So the star that costs I. Now, there's a few ways you can do that, but I guess an easy way is just for each cost, we create like a, a list of numbers that that star matches. So to do that, we can create an array of vectors costs and they can cost up to to n almost in. yeah less than n that makes sense um, yeah and so this will say costs i contains all the stars that cost 
Right. And we'll say it contains all the, um, the D values, the T values contains the prices of all the stuff that got stuck because that doesn't lose any information. So, so we've kind of done this weird transformation where we, instead of for each index, we're storing its, its cost and its, uh, what should I call it? Okay, it's T and it's D. We store for each possible D value, what are all the T values that match it? Okay, so we need to actually do that. So we're gonna say cost D I. So that just adds it to a list in case you haven't seen vector before. So, so now each cost is just that. And for star that cost I, now that we now we can just do that nicely. So a star uh, in the list in the vector cost I. We're gonna add that. Okay. So that was the first step. So that was not really a step here. Oh, I guess it was. Yes, it's like the loop step kind of. Okay, so now we want to find the cheapest option. So, so pq.top will give you this operation, um, cheap, determine the cost of the cheapest star, and pq.pop will delete the cheapest star. So the first thing we need to check is if there is no stars available. So if pq and there's a function that can do that. So pq.top, I think it will, what will it do? I don't know, some kind of error, obviously, if it's empty. So we should check if it's not, if it's empty first. And if it is empty, then we're dead because we can't buy anything at this stage. If it's not empty, then we're good. Then we can buy the thing that is at the top. And we buy the thing that's the top because it's the cheapest star. So instead of uh, setting a bought array, we'll just pop it from the stack. So we'll pop it. And before we pop it, we will check. We will uh, add it to our answer. We'll add the value to our answer. So yeah. I guess this is a nice demonstration. It shows all the all the priority queue stuff in just a few lines, along with some vector vector shenanigans. All right, so let's make sure it gets the same answer. Star is not a thing that I made. Uh, That's not how the syntax works. In start there. Oops. Impossible. We chuck that one back up the top. 11. Fun. Managed to break it twice. So 11. How could we get 11? Oh, yeah, this should be the issue. So priority queue in C++, it's pretty dumb. It's not dumb, but it's really weird how it works. It actually extracts the greatest element. So we need to modify this so it takes the greatest element. So it takes the least element because we want the cheapest thing. And to do that, we, there's a few ways you can do it. Uh, one hacky way, but sometimes you should, sometimes nice way is to just make these all negative. Uh, and I guess I'll do that. So we push negative star, and that means it, it takes out the biggest one. So we'll take the smallest negative value. And that means that this is the wrong way around. So we need to correct that. And now it should work. Eight, nice. Okay. So contains minus cheap. Value. It contains minus uh, D T for each available star. And so, yeah, 
So again, when you we need to pq.top and pq.pop, it extracts the greatest element. So it extracts them with the smallest ti value. Okay, uh, does, that, does that hacky trick make sense? I guess does this whole thing make sense? Because I've gone through quite a lot. Uh, let's... Stars. Cool. Oh, I was missing the machine. Let's get rid of. Okay. Mm. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So I guess all we did when, when we were changing from this to this was we use some C++ thingo, some black box that gives us this, this, these operations, push, empty, uh, top, and pop. And they allowed us to solve the problem. Oh yeah, and I really should have mentioned, uh, what, why, why did that help us? It's because these things can be done fast. So basically, we implemented a really crappy priority queue here. Crappy in the sense that it's really slow because each thing took a whole loop. Um, but here, here we didn't have a huge loop. So that's a different thing. Um, I guess I should have mentioned that this thing will only, will only fire the amount of times equal to n. So in total, this loop will have an n time. So that's not, that's not bad, but all these operations pq.top especially. So pq.top before we used a loop and we used our cheapest option thing. But now it actually can do this really fast. So every operation here uh, is either a log or constant time. That one's definitely constant time. That one, I think it's constant time. That one's probably log time. And that one is log time or constant time. I don't remember. But yeah, so log in case I need to mention it, is much faster than order n. So all of these operations will be done fast. And yeah, so today I won't be discussing exactly why it's log and how you can implement it, but hopefully, hopefully you can see how by kind of abstracting the problem into, into a few operations that we need a data structure to support, we could uh, use that data structure and since that data structure is fast at what it does, it allows us to solve the problem fast. My goodness, is already four four. Okay. People happy with that? Yeah. So. Uh, Okay, I guess we'll move on to another data structure. So this is another problem that you can solve with a priority queue. I guess you can look at this after the workshop today, if you're interested, but it's a bit harder. Okay, now this problem has a lot of flavor text. So I'll just cut to the chase. Get to it on my iPad, it could be kind of slow. So, this uh, is kind of, yep. It might be good to just quickly show how to give a custom comparator to a priority queue if you can. Because uh, oh. they won't always be working with uh, ints, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah so, so in this case, I guess you can just uh, chuck in greater int at the end instead of using negative and it's just a quick example. Yeah, yeah, okay. So instead of the negative, yeah, that's a good idea. So instead of the negative, so we'll get rid of that. And syntax is really weird, I don't understand it, but you have to have, I think it's any container or something there. Yeah, and so then... the second argument is what container the like actual stuff underneath uses to like store the party queue. 
And the third argument is uh, the comparator that you're going to use. So by default, I'm pretty sure it's less. So just less whatever type you have. So if you change it to greater, then like it reverses everything. Yeah. And uh, you can also pass in your custom comparators. You can write your own and things like that. Yeah. Uh, because you won't always be using an int. Sometimes you'll be using like an edge or something like that, maybe, or like a pair or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, so there's a few things you can do. If there's like multiple keys, you could um, like change all of these ints to pairs of ints or tuples even. Uh, and if you have something more sophisticated, you'd, and say you're doing a struct or you're comparing tuples in a weird way, then you can create it, your own uh, comparator, which is, I forget the exact syntax, but it's some function that takes two, two parameters and returns whether, whether the first one's less than the second one and just pass it into that. Uh, I think, yeah, okay. All right, so we'll move on to this problem. So in this problem, you are given a graph. So you're given a bunch of connected connected nodes. So it's, uh, yeah, so in this sample, so yeah, don't worry about all the flavor text. Um, you're just given a bunch of, you, you have a bunch of nodes and you're given their edges. So you have three nodes in this case, and you have an edge between one, two, one and three, and two and three. And so what happened? So during the course of the, the problem, I guess, or reading the input, you get a bunch of updates. And these updates, so E I think means, E means the edge between these two people gets destroyed. So we'll, we'll go through this. So E12 means this edge gets destroyed. So that connection gets destroyed. S12 means, is does there exist a path between one and two? So in this case, the answer is yes, because you can go there and then there. So it's yes. And in this case, I'm oh, sorry. And then you have E13. So that means that, that thing gets deleted. Blue means deleted, I guess. And S12, so are one and two connected. Now there's no path because one is isolated from everything else. So it's no. So if the other sample has anything else interesting. Oh. So the initial graph. One, two, one, three, two, three, three, three. So yeah, so uh, E was destroy the edge. So uh, destroyed S1, 4, 1, and 4 are connected. So yes, because there's that path. Uh, destroyed between 2 and 3. And then S14, 1 and 4 are connected, yes, on the same path. 2 and 4 are not connected because 2 is disconnected. These were kind of, yeah, I guess these, yeah, these were not, I guess one weird thing about these samples was that in both cases, one of the edges for all no queries had no edges coming out of it. But it's not hard to see that there could be cases where there are edges coming out of a node, even though it's still no. Okay. So, yeah. Did, yeah, so I'll give, I'll give a minute again for anyone to offer any thoughts or any, any questions. As I Kevin just asked if you can scroll up. Yep. 
All right. Well, if anyone has any ideas, feel free to unmute. But yeah, so this problem is, it's kind of just like implement a thing, right? You don't even have to really, it, it, yeah. That, so there's certain problems that you'll come across that are just like implement this thing. And in this case, it's pretty much check, uh, you, want, you want to implement some updates and some queries. We updates are deleting an edge and your queries are, are, they, are these two things connected? And in this case, it's not super interesting because there is a, a well-known data structure that can, that can solve something very similar to this. And that structure is called union find. Now union find, uh, I guess, typically uh, solves the problem. You start with a bunch of isolated nodes, or you could start with a graph and then you support two operations. You can either update it, you can add an edge to that graph. So you start with some, some nodes like this. So you need to find, you can add an edge. So either add an edge And the other thing you can do is check if two nodes are in the same component or check if connected. So you can input two nodes into this and, and according to the current edges, you can tell whether they're connected. Now, if you've come across graph theory before, you might remember that if, if you are given a graph and you wanna check if two stuff's connected, you can do that fairly easily just with, some, with any kind of search over the graph. In this case, we, we might have these things kind of inter, intermingled. So we could add an edge and then ask are these connected and then add another edge and then ask are these two connected. Now we can see that this problem seems very similar to this one. This one's just deleting and this one is adding edges. And so if you wanna think about how exactly we can apply this to this, I guess it's not very, it's not very complicated, but we can apply this thing, which, oops. Yeah, whatever, it wasn't that much that I wrote, but we can apply this union find thing to this problem. Now, yeah. So you want us to think about how you could do that. Then you can do that. And in the meantime, I will show exactly how this union find thing works. So use this blank space. So I guess that's, that's the crucial thing. Is that, that's what union find does. Now, yeah. It's kind of nice to visualize this. So you need to find the, yeah. So we'll say we have an update first and say so we're connecting that to that. Now, what we do in union find is we actually make that a directed edge. And to query whether one is in the same component as two or one has a path to two, we traverse all the edges leading out from one until we get to a, a node that is like this. And in fact, what we'll do is we'll initially have all nodes connected to themselves. So we'll initially have like each node connected to itself. And I guess this is just a technicality for implementation. But as the thing goes on, so I'll, I'll delete those, but they're there if there's no other outgoing edge. But as the thing goes on, whenever we wanna connect one and two, we will add an edge like that. So it's kind of arbitrary which way we do it. We can do whichever way we want. But in this case, I'll connect one to two. And that means if I wanna check if one and two connected, then we can climb up every edge until we see, see, see something that connects to itself. So two connects to itself then. So if we query one, two, then we climb two to its, to the, to its top. So two just goes to itself and one just goes to two. And similarly, if, if we have an edge like that, if we now add an edge like that, then if we query one, five, then the, the thing after traversing every edge possible from one is two, and the thing after traversing every edge possible from five is two. So that means that they're connected because they both connect to two. Now, one thing we wanna avoid is having any cycles. So now say one, yeah, so in fact, let's say instead of that, we connect one to five. Now this is this breaks everything because what we want for this data structure is to have each node have exactly one outgoing edge and that has two. So what we do instead 
is because because I guess connectivity is an equivalence relation. We can instead of connecting one and two, we connect two and five. So and to and why why two? Because two was the representative of one. So I should, should clarify that here because we're about to implement it. Representative node you reach after taking the edges until you're at, you're at a thing that um, comes back to itself. Yeah, I'll just I'll just say that. So if we're now connecting two and five, we'll say the representative of one is two. So if we're connecting one and five, um, so we're drawing, we're like drawing edge there. Instead of that, we go from one to two. So we find the representative of one, which is two. We find the representative of five, which is initially five. And instead of linking one to five, we link two to five. And we can do that either way because we're guaranteed that this has no existing outgoing edge except to itself, or that we're, exist we're guaranteed that any representative, its outgoing edge is to itself. So we can either do that, we can do that. Uh, I'll just pick that. Okay. So that is basically all you need to know before we start implementing it. So, okay. So remember for our union find, we need to have two things. We need to be able to add an edge and check if it is, if two things are connected. So to do this, um, we're going to have a helper function, which does this thing for us. So yeah, so we need to set up our representative thing. So we're going to have a, a, a parent of each node. So each node is going to have to connect to one thing and exactly one thing. So we're going to do that. So it is the number of nodes and each thing is going to have a parent. Now, initially each parent will be um, itself because each node connects to itself. And yeah, so that's how we initialize it. And now I'll just implement the function so I won't actually uh, solve any problem. So our functions as I said, so one of them is going to be find our representative. So find rep. And it's going to return a node. So let's say we're finding the rep view. And so we're going to take outgoing edges. And you could do this with the for loop. You could just go while while um, parent of view does not equal u, u equals parent of view. Yes, that works. While Return you that works, uh, but often you'll see, and it's a bit more flexible if you do it recursively. So you say if the parent of u equals u, then return u. Otherwise, return. Oh, you don't need that else, but else return find the representative of the parent of u, and you can see in either case it will go up the chain until it finds something that connects to itself and then it will go back down the, 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 the call stack and it will just return uh, the, the thing that was the thing that was connected to itself. So it will always return something that was connected to itself. Okay, so now we need a thing that can add an edge. So So if we're connecting edges u and v, then as we said, we want to find the representative u, find the representative v, and then draw an edge from u to v. That's the view, rep v. And then yeah, so all we need to do is Rep, rep u 
equals root of v. So that, that draws an edge from u to v, and we're guaranteed that both of these were originally had no, we were guaranteed that that originally had no outgoing edges. So that's fine. In fact, yeah, we could do that, but we'll, that, that will end up being more efficient and we'll see why, or we won't see why, but it will. Okay. Um, It's interesting, never thought about it. You can just do V then. Okay. So yeah, this, this doesn't return anything because it just, it's just combining these two things. And now our query is actually really simple. You, if you were implementing this, you might not even want to function for it, but um, has path between U and V. And that's just checking if their representatives are the same. So that's checking if after we go up all the things, if they go to the same thing. So we want to return if the representative u is representative v. Okay, this works. This is basically what I all I've said so far, all I said on, on the whiteboard. Now, something you might realize after looking at this and thinking about it is there are cases where this is not fast. In particular, if you have like a long line of nodes. Um, I don't know why that cleared, but if you have a long line of nodes, so say you create all these edges for some reason, and then for some reason, some guy comes along and queries this node, like, I don't know, a billion times, not a billion, whatever, 100,000 times. That means every time, or say queries that one and that one. So queries whether these two are connected. That means every single time there's a query, this will have to go up that whole chain. This will have to go up that whole chain. So each query, query could take up to, to, order n, where n is the number of nodes. And say in our input, say, say we're solving a problem that literally just does these things. So the edge between u and v. So say we're just asked to implement a problem or we're just doing an implementation problem where we have to support draw edge between u and v. And I guess that one's, that one's clear already, but u has a part to be. So we just have to support those two things. If we have an input which draws all these edges and then we have lots of queries here, then the input size would only be say n times q or n plus q where n is the number of nodes and q is the number of queries. But this would, each query takes over n. So it would take order n q. So it could be possible that n, if n equals q, equals 1e5, then that's really slow in the worst case and too slow for to pass a uh, problem. So what we do instead, or not what we do instead, but to optimize, so we optimize it. And there's a few optimizations. The easiest one is called path compression. And it just means we kind of abuse um, this parent thing because it doesn't actually have to be its direct parent. It could be anything in the same set as long as anything in the same set, as long as you don't create cycles, et cetera. So what we do is when we query from this node, when, whenever we run a query from this node, we get its parent, we get its representative, sorry. So we get that. And instead of keeping it as it is, we can actually just sever that connection there and create it there. And this will, you can see that this uh, still has all the properties that we want it to in particular. Uh, every representative between this and this will be the same. This will be and this, and this and this, okay? And to do that, whenever we do that, we else, uh, and we just do that. And be even more concise. Let me just do that. Um, yeah. 
And I won't prove it here, mainly because I don't know how to prove it. This makes things fast. And it doesn't actually, it doesn't increase the worst case per query, but increase, it makes the, it doesn't improve the worst case per query, but it improves the average case per query. And just this, just by adding that, and you can actually do that even more elegantly. Uh, so before it was return find rep, now we can do return rep u. So we don't need the else because that's already returned if that happened. So we can do that most elegantly by just doing that. And so just by adding that rep u equals, if we originally had that, just by adding that, this makes the average cost per query order log n, where n is the number of nodes. So that's much faster. So that means if we want to do a lot of these queries, then it will take order q log n. Now, there's some other optimizations you can do. In particular, the common ones are you keep track of how many, for each representative, how many nodes there are in it. And you, you always merge. So you always set the representative. So yeah, I should have mentioned that you can arbitrarily swap. You can swap and makes it faster if we swap. So it's subtree. So um, yeah, I guess this is getting into graph theory a bit, but the subtree rooted at u, rooted at rep of u is smaller and so, so smaller meaning has less nodes. Yeah, so smaller can mean nest boys. It can actually also mean the rank, which you can look up union by rank. And I'll just leave that. Union by size. So there's two ways of doing it. They both improve it by login. And actually together, these make it basically constant time. So if you have all of this stuff and you set up the size stuff, which I won't do for time, then this can be really fast, which means that if you have a problem which involves unifying stuff, drawing an edge, possibly finding a representative, probably not there, and connectivity like that, then this will be able to do it fast. So back to that problem. Uh, does anyone see how we can apply this to solve this problem? So as a recap, this problem is asking, given a graph, you have some edges deletions and you want to ask if there's a path between them. This problem is you start with an empty graph, say, you draw edges and you check if they're connected. So the only difference really is this one, you're deleting edges from an existing graph and this one's you're adding edges to an empty graph. Not this one, this one is adding ed edges to an empty graph. So did anyone see how you could answer all the queries in this problem by um, slightly modifying this? I guess there's anyone lost on the details for this? Oh. How much have I missed? Not too much. Okay. Yeah, path compression. So basically, implementation-wise, path compression, all it was was adding this, adding repu equals. And what it did was down here, it's just whenever we query from a node, there's we, we got some information about its its representative. So there's no point putting that to waste of it. You might as well not put that to waste. And to not put it to waste, you actually update its parent. So before its parent always stayed the same unless we were unifying it. But, but now we're actually gonna update the parent even if, uh, just whenever we're querying it. So whenever we find its representative, we actually set its parent to its representative. So what this looks like in practice is If you have, if you originally had something like this with a long chain, now when you query this, it will set this, this guy's parent to that, this and this guy's parent to that because it had to query this one on the way. So that's how the recursive thing works. So it's like that. And so that, so originally the tree was like that, but what it did was, sorry, 
what it did was flatten the tree. So now that node there, and now everything is just directly connected to this. So sorry for my crappy pen color. So now everything is connected. So it just flattens the tree up by, um, by setting the parents as the queries. All right. Yeah. Yeah, the Wikipedia page is quite good, I think, and the internet in general. I'd explain this. All right. So since no one solved this, yeah, I don't know, probably pick some some people. I think Kevin did say go back in time. Oh, I thought that was some weird comment on your Wikipedia page or something. But yes, that is how you do it. So yeah, the idea is that deleting is like the opposite of inserting. So what we do is we just uh, look at the graph that this creates after all the deletions, and then we go back up. So whenever we see a S query, we just query it like normal, but when we see an E, instead of deleting it, we add it back. And so we answer all the queries in reverse, and then we print all the answers. So we don't actually do this online, we do this offline. So we use the fact that we have all the queries in advance. Yeah, nice. Uh, can you just quickly explain online, offline? I think most people will never heard of it. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it's not a super important point, but in this thing, we kind of handle all the queries as we go. Like if we have functions like this, then we can just call them and we're good. But sometimes, sometimes this is not feasible or much harder to do. And in this case, we don't actually we don't actually like say yes as soon as we read that. We don't say yes as soon as we read. You can't see where I'm pointing. We don't say yes as soon as we read that. We don't say no as soon as we read that. Sorry, it's the S ones. So online means we say we answer the queries as we get them. So an online query problem is say we had to answer this before we've given this. Now I think in ICPC you will probably never get a problem like that just because of the constraints of how the problems work. You usually get the whole input. You can read the whole input. It's possible, I guess, but I don't think I've seen it. But yeah, in this case, you have all the queries in advance. And that means that you don't actually have to answer them in order. You can answer them however you want. And so what we do, the trick for this problem is to start at the bottom. And as Kevin said, go back in time. So yeah, so. We have like, so like, I guess this might make it clearer. Instead of, instead of going like for query, answer query, we say for query, store the query, store query instead of answering it. And then we go through the queries in whichever order we like. In this, in this case, we go through them backwards. For query, in our order, answer query, do updates if we need to. So yeah, hopefully that makes it clear the difference between offline and online. That's for query in our order. So we just do it in whatever order we want rather than the order that they come. And we wouldn't be able to store all the queries if we had to answer them as soon as we got them. We'd have to answer them straight away. All right. Uh, yeah, so that's all I'll be covering.